Well, thank you. Um, thank you. That's uh, quite good. Um, so, obviously, you can hear me because I can hear myself pretty good. I'll uh, step back a little bit. So, tonight we're going to talk about the townhouse. And, and what I would like to, to, uh, to kind of, my premise is that, the, you know, the image of New York to outsiders and to New Yorkers themselves, it's always been sort of, or most recently, you know, about, yeah, about yeah. these skyscrapers. And that's, what, that's what New York means to, to most people. But I'm going to say that actually, the real fabric of New York is defined not by the skyscraper, but by the townhouse, by the roadhouse, by these 20 to 25 foot lots where there's a new event every 25 feet that you know gives us the life that most other American cities have kind of doesn't have. It's not, you know, we have a new event every 25 feet, whereas in Chicago you walk for a block here in one day. So and if you this is an area of Google shop of Brooklyn, if you if you have any doubts, um, just look at Brooklyn from the air. You know, there's acres and acres and acres of nothing but townhouses. And the same is true for good parts of Queens, certainly the villages, Harlem, the Upper West Side and East Side, are principally townhouses, these lots. Well, the townhouse type in New York, the New York townhouse house is actually not an English type, even though we're in the town. And in fact, the English type of, of townhouse, this is, a, this is the earliest townhouse I can find. This is a Romanesque house in, in uh, Lincoln. And you can see that the English townhouse form has already, has already kind of evolved here. The ridge pole is parallel to the street, and the building is long ways to the street, and whole villages are thus constructed. Again, the houses are long ways to the street, and that's the English pattern. And again, now New York is just the opposite. Our houses are perpendicular to the street. And in fact, there we are perpendicular to the street. Um, we really belong to a different tradition, which is a continental tradition, and specifically Dutch and Flemish tradition, where these houses are all parallel to the are all perpendicular to the street, and the ridge poles are running perpendicular to the street. And if you look here in Amsterdam, you can see that all these ridge poles here, all these houses are long and skinny to the street. And here along the canal, even more so. And this is for a couple of reasons. First of all, it gives you proximity. You don't have as far to walk to your neighbors, obviously, because there's no so skinny. And also, you're, you've got a utility here. The utility is the canal. And in this case, it's the street. So you're trying to get as many units along the expensive utility as you can. So the mm -hmm. locked height gets long and gets narrow. If you think about, here's your typical uh, New Amsterdam house, and you see it's almost all windows. And in fact, parallel bearing walls here and here, and just short spans of, of timber going the other direction. And the, the front facade is actually, doesn't hold anything up but itself. And uh, so it's not structural which allows you to have as much window as possible because you have a very deep house you're trying to get more windows. Same is true for Venice, the other canal city. Here's a little tiny palazzo, Piazzetta, Piazzetta, and again, almost all windows, trying to get the light deep into the house. Now, this is, sorry for the blurriness, but here's old New Amsterdam, and here's a broad street, the Broad Street Canal, and here we have all these little Flemish houses, you know, running along the canal. And here in this rendering, is, as we pass by, you can see them marching down the canal there. This is Broad Street. 
And the curious survival of this type is on 29th Street, where we have the Dutch uh, gambrel roof. There's even, all you have to do is see the little hole there for the attic and the, and the, uh, and the uh, pulley to pull stuff up there. And you have pretty much a Dutch house surviving uh, up into the early part of the 19th century. Well, obviously the English took over in 1665, and we began to get a mixture of things here and here. But you know, there's still Dutch pattern, Dutch pattern occurring, Dutch form church. But if you compare, can, compare this to Williamsburg, which is coeval, um, you can see that in, the Williamsburg really follows the English pattern, and in fact. The design of Williamsburg actually is, is coded. There was actually a code saying that the, the, the ridge pole must be parallel to the street uh, such that you don't um, shed water onto your neighbor's house, section, uh, but onto the street or to your garden. It also said that the houses had to be at least 10 feet tall, so they're substantial. And that if there's no house, there has to be a fence to continue the street facade. And here's a typical English town. This is uh, stone and wool. So you can see that that's where it comes from. And the pattern occurs. This is Nantucket. You know, same thing. Well, this would all change. A year after the British take over um, uh, New Amsterdam, uh, the Great Fire of London occurs. And that wipes out all these old uh, Elizabethan buildings for a large part of it. And that's kind of what that would have looked like. Again, these are timber houses you know, jettying out onto the street, trying to get, you know, actually getting as much uh, free real estate as you can. And after the fire, there was a huge shortage of workmen. So where did they go? They went to Holland <laughs> and Flanders. And so there was a giant influx of Flemish builders. And what did they build? They built this type of house. Mostly window, but in this case, brick. Flemish brick and Flemish bond. These sort of diapering around with the rough brick. So these are early, uh, early 18th century houses. And so the pattern of the English house changes to the row house, the brick row house, a lot like the low country. The mostly windows. The other innovation which occurs is the sash window, which comes from the low countries as well. The sash window that slides up and down versus casement windows which open out on the hinge. This is a lot more efficient and it, uh, it's a lot, the seal is much better. Weatherproof. So again, these are sort of Wren period Queen Anne house or later Queen Anne houses um, with the rub bricks and the Flemish bond and, and mostly in the in satchel works. Well, it's hard to believe that New York was once a red brick Georgian town, but it was. And this is St. John's Square, which is now where the Pollen Tunnel is. Um, but you can see these are all sort of, these are typically, they're narrow houses, per se, but they're, they're, they're essentially Georgian houses here. With the, and as the town develops, these things start to disappear, unfortunately. And this is a little sketch by Prentiss in Vanishing New York. But the New York townhouse had developed as a type. And it's a type that differs a little bit from the English house. And begins to, and it does have a few Dutch notions. The first one is this here. This here. English houses don't have stoops. Or if they do, if they do, they're only a couple of steps up. How about one, one uh, 
encyclopedia versus. <laughs> One read the paper. Should do it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, could have done that earlier. Well, that part of the lecture is boring anyway, so you don't have to worry. About it. Um, anyway, English houses you almost walk right into, right on the ground. But Dutch houses are elevated. The stoop is a great invention because, first of all, you know Holland kind of floods and stuff, gets you off the wet ground. But also, it elevates the piano nobile, you know, the living floor, off of the ground. So as you walk down here, you kind of see the ceiling, but you don't see the, you know, this privacy effect here. You don't see any activity in there. The other thing it allows you is a back door <coughs> under the stoop. So the service door of a New York townhouse is here, because, you know, we don't have alleys. Now, this is Morton Scorsese's uh, <laughs> a version of Five Points, and here's the town, and it's this sort of chaos that you know, prompted the city fathers to come up with a new plan. And this is the 1811 commissioner's plan, and you know, here's old Dutch New York, and they even have actually gone in here and fixed some things, even though it's already been developed. Here's Greenwich Village, another little knot of, of funny streets. And then, of course, you know, all the way up to 207th Street, I believe. You know, one block after another, repeating over and over again, a kind of monotonous kind. Of, um, not great. But a lot's been said that say, well, of course, this plan dictates, uh, you know, that dictates the urbanism. These are 25-foot lots, and that dictates. Well, actually, it's the other way around. This plan was drawn such that you could build um, the, the Dutch townhouse versus these English ones, which are along to the street. And so, all these little lots here are to facilitate long, skinny Dutch houses, and they are, you know because the, the long part of the block is, uh, to, or is running east-west, these houses would all get a, a southern exposure at least on the front or on the garden facade. And if you're gonna buy one of these, buy one that has a south-facing garden. Um, it's a little better. But you know, these, they had a choice. They could have made the lots wider and, and, and the streets closer together and done a kind of an English pattern but they chose the Dutch pattern. And why? The same reason that the Dutch did a narrow on the canal. This is your utility. This is where the sewer would run. This is where potent water would eventually run. This is where your electricity now runs. All of your utilities are here. Utilities are expensive per linear foot. So the more units you get on that, the more units are to pay for the utility. Now, the, the Merchant's House Museum, which we see right here, and back in its day, with its neighboring townhouse here, which is seen to be a gigantic, ugly, ridiculous hotel, if, you know, if you guys can get into your pockets and help us. Um, it's, a, it's really a, the quintessential townhouse. And if you've not been there, uh, it, you know, it's, it, we're, we're going to run through it and see all the parts. Now again, with this front facade is basically you know, non-load bearing, and it's parallel bearing walls, and you're trying to get the light deep into the house. And these houses are basically one big room all the way from front to back, because again, if they were divided up into rooms, you wouldn't be able to share the light front to back. So the typical New York townhouse, of which the Merchant's House is an example, kind of shares the light from the back to the front by the use of these sort of double parlors. And the stair is almost 90% of pre-war, pre-Civil War houses, 99% have the stair going up the side here. A kind of a not great one. The parlors can be shut off from each other. 
And here's the merchant's house, the raised stoop, and the service entry down below. These are the, uh, the blinds. In the summer, because we have hot summers as well as cold winters, we have both blinds on the outside of the house to regulate the light in the summertime, and then shutters on the inside to keep the cold out in the wintertime. Uh, the plan of the merchant's house is you have the ground floor here, the dining room, list of dining room here, the breakfast room, kitchen, upstairs, you have the bed parlor, and then above that you have bedrooms, bedrooms, and then finally the attic. We're going to look at this room here first. This is the kitchen. And the kitchen was in the back of the house, near the garden. And early on in the in the planning, you're allowed to build on 50% of your property. And the reason for that is that you needed that garden to be a place to have a well, but most importantly also to have a place to have your sister have your uh, your well and your cistern. Another to have your privy. Now of course the the Proximity of the cistern and the privy is a problem, uh, but they didn't figure that out for a while. So here's the kitchen in that back room. And this is the merchant's house, and there's the garden out there uh, with the privies. We go up to the next floor. This little front room up here, which is was labeled dining room. Yes, yeah, so it's a family dining room. But it's also kind of the nursery because the person. The staff or housewife that was up here could then keep a look on the children. So this is that informal room, family room, essentially, where family meals were taken and, you know, children were, were getting, especially had that backwards. The parlor floor, there's formal parlors here, golden black mantle. And then looking the other direction, you can see that it's a double parlor with the ionic order here, separating the pocketing doors. This is the formal dining room for larger cases. Now that front room here, these are double parlor. This front room actually had another purpose. This is the more formal of the house, of the, of the, of the rooms, and it was a reception room, but it was also where you had funerals. So this is where the bodies would be laid out during the wake. And so the front room always had a kind of a kind of a problem, and uh, and hence when they started putting you know not doing this in houses and did it at private establishments, they became called funeral parlors. In the 20th century, of course, to try to get people to use this room, um, it was rebranded as the living room. So that's the origin of the living room. And this is the parlor, you know, this is the sort of ionic detailing here. These are all the uh, historic American building surveys of the house and measure drawings. And this is the Greek interior. The exterior is federal, but the interior is Greek. And all this plaster work, most of which you can see in Maynard D. Feather's uh, uh, pattern book. Upstairs, of course, the next floor would be bedrooms, and the door above that would be bedrooms. And then finally, the very picky up there, with the dormers way up there, was the staff rooms. And so this is where Bridget and the rest of the Irish maids were you know, kind of coming out. And they had to climb up on the bed and up the window. It wasn't the greatest place on earth, but that's what happened. Now, around the corner from the merchant's house, of course, we have the Colonel Row here, which is sort of the grandest of the New York townhouses. But despite what it looks like, inside it's exactly like the merchant. It's the same plan stair up the side, double parlor, the whole, the whole thing. Now, of course, this is being influenced by John Nash or or prior to that, uh, you know, the crescents at the uh, back, at these sort of palace fronts, and intended to look like a giant palace, but in fact they are individual three townhouses. That's what's left of it. 
Now, there's lots of leftover space in the village, leftover little nooks and crannies, which, you know, given the real estate, given what it is, get filled in. So, another type of townhouse is this little muse house here. And they can be one room deep, basically, a stair in the corner, this kind of thing. And they're reminiscent of the, what's called the Father, Son, Holy Ghost house that you see in Philadelphia. <laughs> So here's the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and the stairs smashed in the corner, and, but they're yeah, perfectly easily houses. The other thing that happens is there's a, oftentimes there's a back house as well, a carriage house. You have the townhouses up here in the front, and then you have a house that's built on the back lot. So here, this is West 4th Street, this is our house, and these are the grand houses on Washington uh, Place, and they have a little back house a little, uh, essentially a stable, or something. So these are, this is right before World War I, and that's what they used to look like. And then after World War I, they look like this. Anyway, this is where we live in the East Coast, anyway, because we're now traders. We've moved from the village to yet another carriage house on Slinton Court, which is another set of used houses. So uh, this is now our office in, in Pettitore. So I apologize for moving from the village, but it was, it was a match. As Manhattan moves up town, uh, wooden townhouses occur. We did this one here. But for the most part, they were trying to, they were discouraged, and fires were a big deal. And firemen in New York City were a big deal. Well, they were a big deal because these, these fire brigades were, you know, the heroes of the 19th century. The fires were ubiquitous. There's another one on 92nd Street, um, as we did. So we parked a bus on top of this one, but we renovated that one too. And then, as the, the 19th century goes on, this is a Chelsea house that so has a bow front, this little row of bow fronts on Chelsea, reminiscent of what you see in Boston. But it's missing its scoop, two set scoops. And then there's the, always this little funny thing where they, they get room for the high scoops. They start at the corner building here along the avenue, and then you come to this house that has to do this to, so you can get a little front garden. This, unfortunately, is one of our projects <laughs> for a crazy Austrian who had to have Baroque. And, couldn't do it for hell. and then finally, at the turn of the 20th century, this is just, I only have this, this is Ernest uh, uh, Flagg's house and office. That's his house, this is an architectural office. If you know him, he did the Singer building. But I like it because it actually breaks the mold and the front door is actually on this little side courtyard. 79, 78, somewhere around there, Park Avenue. John also put was in, lived around the corner. They didn't tell you. I no. didn't hear you. They didn't hear that. Down. Can you speak a little louder into the mic? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, we do a lot of renovations. And so the first thing you need to do, and so this is one of our houses that we redid. It's the corner of 11th Street. Um, new windows, new brownstone, new ironwork, new interior, and the like. And oftentimes, the, you know, one of the first things you have to do is put the stoop on because it's being broken up into apartments. Uh, it made better, more sense to have the entry down here so that you can get to each one of these being a floor through or studios. So the townhouse, here it is with its stoop put back on. So that's one of the first things we have to do. Now the next thing is that everybody wants to replace their windows, and I'm trying to discourage that. Windows can be refurbished over and over again. Here's the reason why. This is a modern window. This one's about five years old, and you notice these stick-on mullions here in order to get the double glazing. Uh, that failed. One, two, three failures there, and that will happen to all of them. There's not a glue in the world that's going to hold those onto a piece of glass forever. So. Please don't 
replace the windows. Um, the next thing you have to think about is where the stair goes. Now normally, if it's there, it's going to be here. Oh, let me go back here. And again, so this is not load-bearing. That's not load-bearing, but that doesn't mean it doesn't do structure. The first thing you want to do is, you know, change all the windows, and then they usually want to blow the back end of the house out. You know, take all these out. Well, it's not a great idea, because even though this bit carries no weight, it prevents the house from racking. It's a shear plan. And uh, if you have houses next door, it's no big deal. But if you're an end house, or, or if those houses suddenly went away, having no shear plan here would be a problem. The other big mistake people do is try to remove this wall. They all want to do that for some reason, so they have one big open floor plan. Well, this is a big no-no, because that's actually a bearing wall as well because the joist comes across here, but it cantilevers over to the stairwell. So that's holding this cantilever. So every time I go into one of these 70s renovations, you'll see this thing sagging where they've taken that wall out. And then finally, the stair. So normally the stair goes where it went, which is here. This is, a, this is the same house on 11th Street. It's actually Liv Tyler's house. Um, and here, this house was completely um, gutted. It had been destroyed. Nothing was left except for that new post. That's real. That's original. And everything else you see is brand new. So that's the stair there. You know, oftentimes the stair is kind of gone. It allows you to do some things here. This little swan neck um, uh, newer post, all the meeks. This is the merchant's house newer post here. Um, the balusters, and of course, one of these balusters is going to be steel to allow. And even this is how narrow some of these stairs are. This is only two foot six or so. That's only about two foot six. Very tight in this. And we'll look at this house a little later. It's only uh, 17 feet wide. Well, if the whole interior had been destroyed, you have an option. And the option is to run the stair the other way. Now, the benefit of this is that you, then you get a room with three windows across the back. And then upstairs, you get three windows, three windows. And when you get to the bedroom floors, you get two windows in the bathroom. And it's a very, and you can communicate through here on a, a wide townhouse. So moving the stair is a possibility. But you don't want to do that if that stair exists. Now, stair location on townhouses, just to show you, these are uh, houses in Bath, along the Crescent. There's one location. Another location, central location with the room behind it. Um, these are all possibilities, but see how it's kind of an indictment of the New York townhouse. Just look at all the variety one gets here. You know, these rooms have character, whereas our rooms are you know, rectangles. Even a small house could have a shaped room. The next thing you have to decide is where to put the kitchen. Well, the kitchen, of course, goes best where it went, which is downstairs, communicating with the garden. Same thing here. Again, these are all my work. Or here. Here's the drawings for that room. This one has a little pantry flower room. But then, if the parlor, if the, if the ground floor were rented out as a separate apartment, or if people thought they had to have the floor, this kitchen on the living floor, you have a couple of opportunities here. One is to simply take the dining room, make it that the kitchen. I don't, or try to smash the kitchen back in these funny little areas above the stair. And when you turn the stair this way, these little funny rooms that exist 
disappear. And I will say, this is what one of those kitchens looks like. I've never seen a successful one, but they're tight, and um, it's best to go where it went. The parlor, you should probably leave as is, as this house was, or completely recreate, as this house did. Baths offer, offer opportunity. Again, you can try to smash it up in here, or, which is, again, not terribly as tight, or you take the entire room, which is you know, like this. <laughs> Here's the room beforehand, here. There's the bathtub and the fireplace, the so, you know. So you take the whole room. This is a triple pile house that actually has a center room. And again, bathtub, fireplace, rather nice. Well, I thought we'd just go through one little house. This is the little 17-foot townhouse. And that's the stair looking from the parlor. And every little bit you see here is brand new. Um, all this is composition ornament from Decorator Supply in Chicago. Across here. We actually had this mirror made. Jane Henry here in the village made that. And then that's the detail of the Endymion across the way. The close up. And again, this is all Greek detail. That's the parlor. The rear parlor were turned into a library. And then the little place underneath the stair becomes the bar. You go downstairs under the stair here, this is the ground floor. Um, you have the mud room and the back door under the stoop. The kitchen, which is breakfast room in front, kitchen in back, Just this is also a very tiny house. And then the garden beyond. And because this garden is only 10 feet deep, this trellis and the mirror behind the trellis expands the view. Underneath that room is a cellar, and this is the beginnings of the fireplaces, and we turned that into a wine cellar. You go upstairs, the bedroom floor. The space is always a premium, so. And the little funny rooms above this, at either end of the stair hall, get these sort of treatments. This family had four boys in a 17 foot townhouse that's only 30 some feet deep. So it was a tight fit. Well, sometimes you actually get to build new. And, you know, some things are successful. I didn't do this, but the proportions of this are relatively pleasing, but you know, it's still not great. Um, some are just horrible. This is a row of townhouses in, on West 4th Street, and they started out okay here, and then they had decided they had to be different for that one. Uh, but they're all one building, basically. And if you look, that window and that window and that window are all the same. And this is 11th Street, which is the Rudin's, you know, the, the St. Vincent's site. And again, here, all new townhouses, the only way you know they're individual houses is there's a little slot here and here and here. This is the cornice, I guess. And again, the windows are all the exact same size. There's no differentiation. At the same time as this was being built, and believe me, we begged to get this job, um, we did this. This is, this is State Street in Brooklyn. There are seven townhouses here. They're 15 feet wide. I tried to get him wider, but he had to have seven because it wouldn't pencil the developer. I based them on those Chelsea bow fronts. And the idea was that you would have, because they this 15 foot basically made you have two bay houses, which are never great. So in order to try to get variety, the bow allows you to get three rooms here, three, three uh, windows here. And of course, note that the windows 
graduate as they go up. They're not all the same size. To further differentiate, the two bays have stoops and the three bays you enter on the ground. So the two bay has a stoop, the three bay you enter on the ground, and then some of the two bays have grouped windows at the top, some do not. The plans are not remarkable, and we have very little to do with the plans other than the facade parts. And they, were, they you know, this bows, this is an octagon in the back, you know. And we begged them to do this, which was we could get six townhouses here. Since they're all new lots, we could actually make the lot line do that. And therefore, you could have two bays in the back and three bays in the front, or two bays in the front or three bays in the back. And the stair could be there or there. Um, but he wouldn't do six, it had to be seven. And just a comparison, this was done for $300 a square foot. This was done for $1,000 a square foot. Just again, you enter here below and there above. And then we have different, we have arches here and entablature there, entablature arch. There's the arch detail. And here's the entablature detail. This is all cast stone, made in Brooklyn. This is the cast sheet metal corner, the run street sheet metal cornice, again made in Brooklyn. And so, just to get back to our our scheme, here's the the, the uh, 1811 plan, and here's a picture of Greenwich Village, nice tight little houses here. We see the advantages of the townhouse are here. The density that you can get with these is amazing. You get about 50 houses per acre. Compare that to your quarter acre lot in, in the suburbs. So this, you know, cities are going to have to be more like this than they are like suburbs. Um, these parallel bearing walls allow for this to be a very short span, so they're cheap to build. These are incredibly cheap to build. Um, they've got a lot of advantages. Because there's no side elevation, you're not paying for that wall. You're only paying for three walls, and the neighbors have that wall, and using the neighbor's wall. And you're only heating that wall and that wall. So they're economical and energy efficient. They're also private, because they don't have side windows. You have private garden for each house. And then there's more privacy in one of these than that. Now, it doesn't have to be the, 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 the townhouse plan, New York townhouse plan. There are other options. There's 40 houses per acre on a square block. Uh, this, is, this is done by Tristan Edwards after World War II. Lots of areas of, of London being bombed out, and this was a suggestion. Now, if townhouses are so cheap to build, and they've got so many great possibilities. Why aren't they all over America? Why are every other city off the East Coast have detached houses? Well, this is the reason. This is O'Leary's cow. And Mrs. O'Leary cow brought about the first setback law, which was side setbacks. And it's because of the fire of Chicago. If you can look at old Chicago here, you can see it looks like New York. New Chicago from the air, there's five feet in between each and every one of these houses. So you gotta heat both sides of the wall. You gotta pay for that wall. But that five foot separation there is supposed to keep the fire from spreading. And so this is Chicago, but every city in America outside of the East Coast and potentially St. Louis looks like this. This is San Francisco, same thing. But again, we live in a Dutch town, so we're okay. Um, we have attached houses. Our houses are, we know we're in a Dutch town because our houses are perpendicular to the street. We have stoops, which again is a Dutch thing. And we take the garbage out the front. In other towns, they take it out to the alley. And that's why we live in a Dutch town. Thank you.